Hey, my name is Shanshan. I sell art on shanshan.co. Today we're going to react to Ian Roberts. He's a YouTube painter, a little bit older gentleman. So let's take a look first at his videos. So if we go to the home page, I think he has his latest mastering composition is kind of his intro video which I think is a good start um, you might want to just introduce yourself but I think this is a probably a pretty good start and then he has kind of his upload section uh, composition so that's kind of nicely organized I think um, he has his visions which I guess is like his artistic look on things um, how-to videos so it's a really good uh, layout I like his thumbnails we look at the videos He's using this really bold font on top of the videos. You kind of get the point, like Grand Canyon Show and Tell, so you know immediately. You can read that off your phone easily. So that's a crucial point when you make thumbnails, make it you know bold. You might want to add your face. A lot of artists don't do that. I'm not sure why, but you definitely know who it is right off the bat versus just kind of figuring out, oh, is this this artist or this artist? Because if your art looks the same, you might mix up the style, but he does have a pretty good branding. Um, let's go and look at the first video so the first video is number one composition rule you cannot break hmm. I wonder hi hi Ian Roberts mastering composition and the laboratory of our painting process so I'm saying this week the number one rule you cannot break in composition. So right off the bat, um, he edits a little bit slow. Like I think he could cut maybe two seconds right off the bat and make a quicker intro. He has a really nice uh, tonality to the voice. And he could add a little bit of soundproofing. So there's these uh, wonderful things, which are looks like this and this. And you put them on the wall. I have it right behind me. So it softened the sound. This room isn't really ideal because it's a kitchen, so I can't really put the soundproofing on the kitchen side, but ideally you'd put it on as many sides as possible and it'll cut down on that echo effect. Um, you can use a little fur thing, but that really doesn't take care of the echo. Only those sound walls will take care of that echo. So let's keep going. And you could say in the year 2020 with the contemporary art scene the way it is, the idea that there still might be some rules left seems almost laughable. And usually when someone expresses to me a rule about art, I'm skeptical because probably I've seen somebody that's broken that rule and made something admirable. So we're going to get to that. I mean, you could talk about a rule being, you know, expressing yourself authentically. Just, I'm really curious. <laughs> What's this number one rule you can't break? Because it is true. A lot of composition rules are kind of guidelines. You can use like the two thirds rule and all that kind of stuff. I do a own composition videos myself, so you can check that out. And yeah, there's a lot of rules. They're kind of guidelines. You can definitely break them. So let's see what the number one rule you can't break is. Courage, Courage. To, to be vulnerable, to give that expression. But that's more like advice, right? Even though it might apply to all artists, it's more like good advice. So, so let's skip ahead a little bit. Break this rule dramatically. But you'll see uh -oh. it for I a think very I specific something. reason. <laughs> And then the others are normal representational paintings where I'm going to make adjustments to show how, show how easy it is to start pulling us out of the picture plane. So here in the first painting, I'm showing you an example of someone breaking this rule and doing it very intentionally and very well. You can see that the push in the entire double page spread is over, over to this, to this line, line here, here, which obviously, obviously is where the page is turned. Yeah, so this is a good rule. Um, usually you don't want to point outside the frame, you want to point it inward. So you kind of want to have all your leaning lines kind of pointing inward and draw attention. So it is a little bit of a risk. If you point outside the painting, it's kind of a unspoken rule not to do. And so the child's attention is like, oh, well, what's next? And you might say, well, that was just an accident. But every single double page spread in the entire book is like that. And again, you just see it's just taking us straight over here out of the picture plane. But that's what he wants us to do. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so I definitely think that painting works, but he's definitely breaking the rule of ideally you probably put the rabbit uh, 
maybe earlier, but you have this huge shadow of a hawk chasing the rabbit, obviously, if you can't make that out. Let's see what the next one is here. But look what happens when I create some increased intensity way over there. Our eye is now going right out of the picture plane. I would say it's leading through the picture plane. I wouldn't say that's wrong. This is another this is painting another by Nicola Tim Goff, and we're obviously being pulled and everything is orchestrated to take us to the red building. But look if I take this fence and just make it darker, how it starts to do this, and we start to leave the painting. True. So obviously a fence could be this dark. He hasn't just found a place where everything's perfectly aligned so that he can paint it. He's orchestrating. So I think this is a really solid video. Let's see what else he has here. Let's skip ahead a little bit. Taking us on to the next image. There are so many images out there vying for our attention every day that you want to make sure the viewer is staying inside your picture plane because if you give them a way out, they're not coming back. You want the viewer doing this. You don't want the viewer doing this. Yeah, so I'll leave it there. I think uh, that's a really good composition rule. So this next video is how to make more dramatic painting. Ooh. Hi, Hi, Ian Roberts, Roberts and Mastering and Composition. So I'm painting my neighborhood again this week and the image I'm looking at, it needs help in order to make it engaging. So I'll show you what I chose to paint and then I'm going to show you at different times of the day what the scene looks like and the one I chose because what I needed to create was contrast. I needed to create a drama of lights and darks. I needed to create a drama of the value masses that allows us to be engaged by the image. So I studied the scene, I looked at it different times of the day at the best interplay and so in a way, I'm not really painting the scene, but the way the light hits the scene. It's sort of like a still life, you know, where you set up a good strong light. I'm actually painting the value masses of light and dark. That's the thing that sort of engages the painting. So I'll take you through that process. I've got a short section of my drawing. Skip ahead a little bit. Not a lot that's interesting going on there. So how do we paint something like that? Well, if you go in the early morning, and you get those beautiful shadow shapes coming out all the way down the road and those nice diagonals like on the garage at the back and on that wall and the light hitting the building in the top left, that becomes sort of way more interesting. Only I find the entire left, sorry, the entire right hand side kind of blasted in light and not a lot of form in there. Now at midday, we get some really good lights and darks but the entire left hand side is sort of washed out and there's not really anything to grip our attention and I found of all of the options the afternoon light was the most interesting and so that's the one I chose to paint. So this is a really good study you can take um, if you're painting straight from reels in plein air like he's doing obviously here try different times of the day this is definitely gonna improve the shot I don't know if I'd paint an alleyway an alleyway isn't super exciting to me but there are buyers of this style of painting of just an alleyway. I mean, to me, I would do like a cityscape or a dramatic lighthouse. I think that's more sellable. But, you know, if you're just kind of doing this as a study, it's, it's pretty worthwhile. The drama drew ahead. and it expanded to sort of seven by nine inches, quite large. But I just wanted you to see sort of the process. It's quite windy. You can see the sort of thing moving around. But, and I don't generally like it when it goes so fast because it looks frenetic. And actually, I find the painting, the drawing process, very meditative. It's kind of slow and appealing. But I just want you to kind of see the process of this thing coming together. And I think this is a really great way if you want to do plein air. The first starting point would be a drawing. And it's way easier to do than painting on site uh, because this wind factor dries out the paint. You get paint spilling everywhere. You might get paint. You might not bring enough solution. You might not have enough water. And so pencil is easy. You just bring pencil, eraser, you know, you can bring a couple more items, but if you just have the pencil, eraser, and a sharpener, 
you basically had all your materials. There's no way to screw up that drawing on the fly, so to speak, unless you have it starts to rain, right? So I think it's a really great way to start a drawing um, outdoors and a great way, it's a traditional way to do um, landscape is you first kind of draw it, sketch it out, and then do a study, do a couple studies, and then you paint, right? And then, you know, the lights and the darks and the drama of these things, and then to see the finished drawing, nine by seven, before I actually began to paint. I wanted to show you in this section right here where I'm putting in this dark and then you're going to see I'm putting a lighter part that's just not quite in the shadow so much and then this is the darker side of that great big square bush and then there's the lit side but you'll see and then I put a real dark in next to it just in just a moment but you'll see how that structures all that in shadow into three-dimensionality so that we really have the sense of the structure of what we're looking at. And then, like I was saying last week, in terms of warm and cool, light and dark, these are warm greens against the dark, cool greens. And so they're starting to pop like sunshine. So it's definitely, I really like his rhythm of speaking as well, like warm like sunshine, it's kind of poetic, so it's pretty cool. Let's skip ahead a little bit. Value right, get the temperature right, get the color right, the landscape takes care of itself in a way. I mean, you get the color shapes right. Don't think about buildings so much as just get the color shapes right. One to the next to the next. Here I'm putting in the lit side of this uh, of the road and you can see it against the shadow side and then the little concrete thing there's a little lighter. And then now the shadow side on the other side, cooler and darker. And we start to get the sense of sunlight. And then there's just this one last little spot. It's interesting too, because he's kind of using lighter colors than what's in the photo. The photo, the dark green are really darker and the, the shadow are darker. So he's kind of lighting those up in values. So it's kind of interesting. It still definitely works as a painting, but my I myself, I might use some of that really dark green on top of the bush. Keep that, I mean, the lighter shadow I think works, but I really like personally to use a really sharp dark, but it's interesting to see this develop. So there's the painting, how it looked when I got back to the studio. And I liked the way all this went. I like that. I like a lot of it, actually. But the problem is, this is holding way too much attention. Partly because it's right dead center, and then I've got these diagonals all leading in towards it. And I wanted this to go up to here. So I darkened the garage and added this information up here, and I sort of jogged these so that it was a little bit more attention there. So now our attention gets pulled there and not back to that garage. Often when I get back to the studio with a plein air painting, I'll notice one or two little adjustments that need to be made like that on a painting I generally like. I think it's a really kind of interesting way he's analyzing his own painting. I definitely do this in my painting, I kind of analyze how it could be better, what I would like to do, you know, struggles along the way. So it's a really cool process. I think it's a really great way to do a painting tutorial and to learn how to do great painting. This one is the greatest painting in the world. Let's see what that's about. So it's another composition one. Hi, Hi. Ian Roberts, Robert. and Ian welcome Robert. to Mastering Robert. Composition and the Laboratory of Our Painting Process. Last week we had the sign up for my uh, Master in Composition course and I hope, you know, figured the cart would be open for 10 days. The course filled in a few hours. It was pretty crazy. But I decided to create a second course for the, it'll be in June. And there are about 10 or 12 places still left in that course if you're interested. So I think this is a really good way as, as an artist as well as a student. So artist wise you can really pitch yourself as the expert and do classes and really reinforce those beginning artists and help them come up to your level. At the same time, by teaching, you're really gonna get much better at the basics. So if you teach composition, you're better at composition. And so that's self-reinforcing for his own painting, but as well as you reach out to artists and uh, you know make that connection with the artist, it's a really great way to sell yourself as the artist later. People will buy his work, but also you can make that second income as an artist just teaching. I don't think that's his intention per se, but he definitely has the skill set for composition. So it's a really cool kind of process and a good way to use your YouTube channel. I'd be delighted if you joined me. And for all of those that did, did sign up, I really appreciate it. Skip ahead a little bit. He had cancer and he went to Europe in December. All right, so it's the whole backstory of the artist. Of all time, 
by my favorite painter, Velázquez. And it's a Definitely painting of the Niñas, the Ladies in Waiting, 1656. So I've seen this in person. It's a really kick-ass painting. I actually studied in Spain in the Prado, so it's just a really super interesting painting. There's multiple, multiple levels of this. We'll see what his analysis is. Now, Velázquez, we could say, is the first Impressionist in the sense that he didn't paint what he knew was there. He just responded to what his eye could see, and he didn't paint more than that. And in many ways, you can't see that in reproduction, because in reproduction, it just looks like it's real, because he's painting what's there enough so that we know whatever he's looking at, that's what we're seeing. It's not until you go up close and you realize, wow, I mean, he hardly painted anything there, and yet, from viewing distance, it looks fantastic. He's a very modern painter. And this particular painting is a very modern psychological moment. It's a very engaging moment of participation of us as, well, I'll show you when we get to it. And I've done an analysis, which you can see here, just drawing some lines, trying to figure the structure. Um, and we don't know the actual structure, but you can see some of the basic funda foundational lines seem pretty reasonable to assume. Um, so we'll have a look at it now. So here's the painting. Now the first thing is it's big. There's a picture of some people of it in the Prado. And second, in terms of structure, I mean, I showed you that diagram of all the lines I was trying to use to figure this out, but some of the simpler ones, we have at the halfway point, right through the tops of the heads and across these lines here, we have that holding that together. At the third, we have going right through the princess's face here, those two sets of eyes. The midpoint runs right down through her, through her, and so we have an obvious triangle here. And if we take the line that's running here and run a diagonal down to here, it goes down the back here, and we can see it working there. And the same line over here, we run it to this corner, we get the back of this girl. I didn't draw it very clearly, but it's the back of that girl. We've also got the structure from the top of the princess's head. All right, so I think he made a really good analysis of this painting. Um, I would 